secret $80,000 Holden Colorado V8 that nearly entered production. An HSV Sports Cat Super Ute was months away from showrooms ahead of rumored Ford Ranger Raptor V8. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode number 209, the HSV V8 Colorado that got away. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me in looking at this intriguing story of a bent eight ute that could have been uh, staff journalist and EV guide maestro, Tom. Hello. And key contributor, Byron. Hello, everybody. All right. We'll also look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and dive into your feedback. Uh, YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's get firing on all eight cylinders. And this is a story I find it Really fascinating. Um, our own Justin Hilliard authored this story through the week. And he was at uh, Walkinshaw Performance and almost stumbled upon uh, this whole story because sitting in front of him was a rather intriguing vehicle. And uh, it, it turns out that it was a V8-powered HSV sports cat. And when he started to inquire, they were very forthcoming. Yep, this was a project we were undertaking just before the rug was pulled out from HSV and, of course, by extension, Holden more broadly. So while at that time, we're talking 2019, um, everyone and their dog was talking about whether or not the Ford Raptor should have a, a V8 under its bonnet, he was HSV quietly producing just that kind of vehicle. I find that extraordinary. Tom, does that pique your interest? I'm surprised we don't have uh, more of these, but this is one of those stories where you always think, this is what goes on behind the scenes that you, you know, you never get to see. And it's just funny that, you know, uh, these guys have actually just gone ahead and talked about it now, but I suppose there's no one left to annoy. So like, I, I, I love it. I love that it exists and um, just surprised that we don't have more V8 Utes uh, like dual cab class Utes. And I think the whole, um, you know, there's an obvious reason behind it because these, this class of pickup truck, you know, is smaller than the ones that traditionally have V8s overseas in America, like, you know, yes. 150s, what have you, full-size pickups as they call them over there. Um, just because, you know, the market for dual cabs that we take for, for granted here are built around having a four-cylinder diesel engine. Absolutely. So, I mean, we get excited when we see like Amarok having a even more powerful V6. So, mm. you know, uh, that territory is even, you know, yet to be fully explored, I think. But you and know, you're, the, and you're the right. flavor is mean, definitely there for it, isn't it? The, the, the dual cab is seen as a full-size vehicle here, notwithstanding mm. uh, the fact that Ram and, and the GMSV version of Silverado have done uh, pretty pretty well but yeah they're seen as full-size things and, and it's one of those things that you wish actually made it to production right like oh, it's okay. so holden to do something yeah. like this it's so hsv you know well i know if if senior bob is listening or watching he'll be jumping up and down because it's exactly the kind of thing that he's been asking for uh, via this podcast for some time yeah and there Byron, are so there what are, are you make, what do you make of it? well yeah uh there are so many um skunk work type models that will be revealed in a, in a, I guess in over the next decade, maybe 20 years um, as time uh, departs what um, uh, moves forward from what uh, happened with the Australian car industry and Holden is you know obviously one of the key things. There are tons of things like this. Uh, the Colorado uh, especially was probably Holden's savior. Yep. Uh, it was definitely seen as the car that could probably um, get them out of the post Commodore, post Australian manufacturing, um, I guess, hole that they'd been, they, they'd kind of dug themselves into by being so affiliated with the Commodore. And it just makes sense, doesn't it? That there would be a high performance version. You can imagine there would have been, it, it could have definitely been in the vein of the SS. Yep. And, um, and I mean, I suppose towards the, the end, what turned out to be the end, um, Colorado was a, a sort of shining light amongst some some fairly uh, in the shadows type models um, yeah. in their range. It, you, you're right; it was the only one doing anything. And and you're talking about Skunk Works and and what have you. I'm always fascinated by, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people are, the stuff you don't see. It's like the automotive dark web. You know what what is actually going on out there <laughs> that may never come to light, but often does, as you say. It, and you think you think about designers and engineers. Mm. What are they doing every day? You know, once a model's signed off, 
that's it. It's into its model cycle, Emma. They're doing all kinds of stuff all the time yeah. um, that doesn't get up. And that, that's what you'd love to know about, but it's hidden. The, the thing that fascinates me even more about this particular car is our Holden Colorado was paired with the Isuzu D-Max version, the RG Colorado, and with the, its equivalent back in, I think, 2011 or 2010 when it was unveiled. Yep. Yet there was the North American one. And as it turns out, those cars had a relationship. I wonder why there were basically three cars off that particular thinking within GM's mindset. Right why didn't we just get this North American Colorado in the first place? Why did Holden go to the problem um, the trouble of redesigning or or, or you know or changing yep. the um the Isuzu D Max, which to be fair, I mean, I did the launch and uh, the subsequent facelift launch of that particular car. Those cars were actually uh, the GM Brazil homeroom, right? Yep, that Isuzu had had um, had collaborated collaborated with. So, would it would it be something to do with the fact that you know the, the Colorado was manufactured in Thailand? There were certain economies there, particularly for distribution into this market. It maybe didn't make sense to build the US version of Colorado in that plant because of the popularity of dual cab cabs in other markets in well, Southeast Asia. And well, James, what I mean by is that they could have just um, they, they they could have just made the Col the Chevy and the Holden Colorado yep. the same vehicle. Same vehicle, yes. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And in hindsight, and of course hindsight's always a you know, is always a benefit, isn't it? Or deadly accurate. Yeah, deadly accurate. Um, you know. It would have probably fitted the market more today, given that the Chevy end up being slightly larger or definitely yes. looks slightly larger. So yes. those cars definitely would have had uh, a component relationship being developed within the GM sphere with Isuzu's um, input. But it just boggles the mind. You know, they're yeah. just being uh, like needless duplication is what I'm talking about. Yeah. There's quite but, a bit of that in GM's historical global catalog though isn't there i think you know it probably wasn't uh you know a bad move for them to just focus on america yeah mm. it's, mm. A, it's interesting i suppose that'll be a challenge uh from here on in that markets will be much more differentiated than they ever have been before in terms of regulatory control on internal combustion engines you know you might be able to sell certain cars here but not there how do you become a global brand you know forget one Ford, that, that's, that's probably not going to work out economically anymore because it's such a diversified mm. automotive world. Yeah, well, this is one thing that I, I keep trying to explain to people who don't understand why we do and don't get certain models here is because Australia is rapidly becoming backed into a bit of a corner where we've got the safety standards of Europe, yep. the emission standards of Southeast Asia, and the requirements of some blend in the middle. And so yes. you end up with cars, you know, I think we're going to see a bit of a correction. We've got so many cars available in Australia now. I think in the next couple of years, the amount of makes models available are going to start dropping because they'll become EVs and they won't necessarily be marketable here. And so they'll sell them in Europe. Yeah. Or... Uh, on the other hand, you know, we'll start to get more Chinese players as well. So I think there's going to be a bit of a mix up in our market in the next couple of years as, yeah. you know, we try to come to terms with the fact that, okay, well, you can't just import a, a car built to Thai standards because it won't pass ADRs. It won't well, pass that, ADRs. That, that sort of brings, brings us back to that whole nature of what HSV was, which was a, a small, nimble kind of business able to almost on a custom basis create cars. And, and this... This uh, sports cat is a perfect example. I mean, uh, putting a, a ZL1 um, into uh, a Colorado, and then I think they even swapped out the transmission. So uh, you had, so stock was a six speed torque converter auto. They dropped in a 10 speed. <laughs> um, so, you know, that really went to town. And the engineering that they displayed over successive iterations of HSV Commodore based product was really pretty impressive and uh, that, uh, to be able to pull this off and um, according to, to Justin there are three prototypes that were made one of which is registered and painted in the same color which I want to say is performance blue as the original VL uh, Group A Walkinshaw Commodore that homologation special back in the late 80s and it's just sitting there uh, registered 
Um, and there it was. While, while everyone was looking over here, is Ford going to put a V8 in that Ranger Raptor? There's HSV and they've done it. And there it yeah. is physically sitting there. It's amazing. Gee, I'd love to drive it. I wonder what it would have felt like, uh, you know, on a wet road, for instance, with all mm. that power going through. And HSV really had a good set of components to start with from the V, especially from the VE Commodore onwards in terms of yeah. suspension geometry and, um, and brakes and, 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 and dynamic yeah. Um, I guess safeguards and capability. Yeah. But is this would this have been a case of uh, the Colorado just being a sales ear that was just too far gone to be turned into a silk purse? No. Well, like- I mean, the, the interesting thing is, Byron, that we're talking about the sports cat, but at the same time, GM had been talking to HSV, um, and now by extension, there's sort of a dialogue with Walkinshaw um, about the US version, and there's a left-hand drive prototype uh, of the ZR1 called ZR2. Um, which has the Camaro's V8 in it. Um, and that is sitting there as well. And over time, even though it's gone cold because, you know, Holden pulled out of this market, there's a lots, of, lots of sensitivity around that. Um, it could be reignited at some point in the future. And HSV holds out, has kind of lights a candle every night as to whether, you know, GM might look at this whole folio of, of stuff and go, yeah, you know what? It would be good to have a V8 well, in Colorado. It would give- I was going to say in the States, they've got, they've got a four-cylinder, they've got a, a V6 petrol, and they've got a turbo diesel, like a Duramax, but they, they don't have a V8 in, in the Colorado in the US. But would it give them the, I mean, it would give them a price point, I guess, even if it's a $100,000 price point as opposed to $150,000 or $200,000 price point for an HSVU. Yeah. But, Maybe but, someone who wants a V8 that doesn't want to go to the size of a Ram, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, and it looks good. Let's face it, that's a good-looking machine, right? Mm. But um, maybe HSV is working on electrified U because let's face it, that with that's the Rivian, where, yeah, that's, yeah. Where it, that's where it is. Isn't that right, Thomas White? You well, the this EV. is what strikes me about, you know, you were saying before, Walkinshaw is kind of small custom automaker who can, you know, use existing platforms to build things. I think that's going to be the maybe the biggest frontier going forward is I, I was having this thought uh, and talking to Hyundai about it, that this, this idea that you can essentially swap a hydrogen fuel cell stack into a, a combustion platform car because the components are sort of similarly sized. It's, it's okay. not so outrageous. Have you got a direct you- line to the president of Hyundai? Yeah, Tom. <laughs> no, no, no. So, I was so just, you mean, just picked that up and went, hey. And you, I was, and you, and I was chatting to, to them about this concept because, as we know, the Ineos Grenad- the Grenadier is going to have a version which will have the Nexo's uh, drivetrain in it. And so, um, you know, basically the question to them, and they, they, they did kind of evade directly answering it, was, you know, can you essentially do this to any combustion popular Hyundai that's on the market now because you know if the components are the same size and it's a yeah. way of letting these platforms continue to exist into a zero emissions era then um you know I think and you don't that's... you don't have to accommodate a battery no you don't well you do you, but it's, it's a, a small, small one it's a small yeah. one it's, it's you know small it's one. A, a, yes a, I should say Toyota hybrid size battery and you know, like for that. for anyone uh, watching or listening make sure to look at Dave Morley's video on driving the prototype Ineos uh, it is great I would recommend it highly. He it was a really good video. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I wonder how much these things would weigh. I'm talking about the uh, the electrified, yeah. or yeah. I guess the hydrogen one may, may not won't weigh as much because of, yeah, it doesn't have the battery yeah. requirements. But um, it's fascinating, isn't it? I, I I think immediately, just you know, how, whatever how many minutes into this discussion we are in, it hmm. seems that uh, that rather than look backwards to a V8. HSV should be looking forward to electrification of whatever. Yes. If, it, if well, this sort of project is ever going to eventuate. Just one more, one more glance backwards. Um, the price was going to be somewhere for, for the HSV Sports Cat V8. Uh, they were going to pitch somewhere between seventy nine and eighty three thousand dollars. So let's call it eighty one grand. Um, Gee, how, that's that's specific. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's my price, but between seventy nine <laughs> and eighty three. All right. So I'm, I'm splitting the difference and calling it 81. Um, how do we think that would have gone at that kind of price? Oh, yeah, looking at the market now, why not? Like It seems pretty competitive to me. Yeah, definitely. Look, it would have been a smash hit because not only 
would it have had the performance, uh, uh, you know, unique performance in that within that segment? It also had the Chevy Colorado styling, yes, which I think looks better than the uh, the whole layout yeah. did. Do you yeah, agree? Yeah, I think so. It looks a bit tougher. It's certainly got that US corporate GM look about it, um, mm-hmm. which yeah, I think it's a more more contemporary in a way, but in a in a kind of contemporary US way. Yeah, I think it's better proportion. I think okay. it looks very like Baja, right? It's ready mm. to jump some dunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such a good get from Justin to just wander into uh, into the Clayton or wherever they are now. Are they still in Clayton? Yeah, of course they are. Um, in here in Victoria, uh, and see these uh, stillborn prototypes and go, "Wow, what's going yeah. on?" Well, that, I mean, that is I was- what we're going to miss out. Not having an Australian car industry it just breaks my heart. Well, you know, the walk, in, in talking to Justin, the Walkinshaw Group general manager, a guy called Rick Perchold, um, said, look, typically we'd been in a V8 business in the days that hold on Commodore-based models. So the desire there from the end user was, can we have something that's got a V8 in it? So there's this kind of latent buyer group out there that there were so many passionate HSV people. They, they love those cars. That V8 thing has gone away. You're right, Byron. It, it would have gone off, I would have thought, um, mm. in a in a post V8 Commodore world. Mm. Um, and dual cab utes, as we know, have become the kind of recreational vehicle of choice. Um, even without a V8, the, the dressed up ute has become the the RV of choice uh, for a lot of buyers. Mm. My you, um, I filled up uh, <laughs> my tank, my press car tank, uh, at two dollars seventeen a litre because I had to put ninety eight. Right. Wow. So, you know, I'm not sure whether that that situation would have lasted forever. I think that sounds like New Zealand pricing. Yeah, yeah. 98 Ron is, oh. isn't cheap at the moment. So well, look, and just to just to hang that little tantalizing tidbit out there again, this you know, he said also the left-hand drive Colorado ZR2 V8, quote, potentially, unquote. Um, helps the business case for GMSV introducing a right-hand drive Chevrolet Colorado that's remanufactured by Walkinshaw Group to sit underneath its fourth-generation Silverado range. So there's a possible two-way street here that Walkinshaw gets a left-hand drive US version of Colorado, converts it to right-hand drive and puts a V8 in it and could do a job for GM on a small volume build of V8 Colorados that could you know, be done in the US or done here or whatever. He says, in essence, the Colorado ZR2 V8 just showcases what we're capable of, regardless of what core vehicle uh, it's in, that we're able to produce something of that nature, he said. So just to, you know, that little glimpse of maybe that could happen um, at some time in the future. Well, if anyone can make change the success of Colorado though, like do, do we think that, you know, um, would have made any difference for the for the history of that car? Uh, I think oh, I think it would have added another string to its bow and um, given it a boost, you know, pretty solidly into its life. That wow, you know, there's an HSV version of the V8 that would yeah. have given it a real and and and, a, and, a, and I know, like you know, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the global uh, kind of manufacturing of that car that, that ultimately caused its its death. But it, it was interest. It's an interesting thought just because uh, I was talking once to a, a, an AMG, a guy from AMG on a launch and in Germany or in Austria, but anyway, he was from Germany and yep. um, he was, he cornered a few Australian journalists and he was asking us why X class didn't work. And the answer was pretty much all the same. We, we were all saying, Oh, we well, should have launched with the V6 and you, you should have done a yeah. X63. And he was puzzled by this concept of an X63. It's like, he, he was saying, what, what do you mean? You, you put a V8 in a ute. And we were all like, yes, this is what you should have done. He was, he was yeah. like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it just didn't. That, that's the thing. Compute. I mean, Australia by proportion of Mercedes vehicles sold in this market, the number of them that are AMG, it's the highest in the world. So, yeah. um, and and the, the passion for dual cab utes is also, um, a characteristic of this market. So put those two things together. And yeah, it makes perfect sense in the Australian market to have a, a V8X class and have okay. an AMG version. All right, then memo to Hyundai. Uh, we want the Santa Cruz. We want it with a Nexo powertrain <laughs> or possibly like, you know, an Ionic 5 powertrain. You know, turn the wick right up 
and just like just watch the customers just kind of pour in and the right. money pour in and I think it would be absolutely well that that's a factor of your product planning side hustle isn't it really it is, you've got absolutely. you've got you know various people on speed dial around the globe and it, yeah. they're, they're on to you consistent it's very much a a, a skunk works side hustle down the corner of my yes. street here but yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, look to answer your question um it would have been too little too late i think to save the colorado let alone holden um but the uh the what ifs are fascinating you know it shows also that we were probably destined to get the Colorado sooner than later since HSV had, you know, a bunch of them here. Yeah. Don't you reckon? Well, well also, it's worth thinking about the fact that there's um, uh, Walkinshaw has this car registered in Victoria SV8 CAT, SV8 CAT. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a road going vehicle. I don't know whether that's a temporary registration. It certainly doesn't seem like it, given no. the car was done in 2019. That's going to be at a Shannon's auction. Um, sometime in around, what, 2030, 2035? Pulling an enormous price, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like that uh, Holden uh, uh, Tirana-based coupe from the 70s. Uh, what was it called again? GTRX. Oh, GTRX, that's right. Um, yep. There was an auction in the 1980s for the, uh, within Holden for the uh, remaining two body yes, shells. Do you remember that? Yes, yes, yeah. I do. I do. Um, so that happened 15 years I think 15 or 16 years after the car was meant to be launched, but it didn't so happen, I think, in 87. And, and um, GTRX was so interesting because they were so far down the track that the marketing teams had to st had started to develop merchandise and brochures mm -hmm. and all of those things that you need to get working on to get yeah. a car in market uh, so, before the pin was ultimately pulled. So the, the, this potentially is the 21st century GTRX? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. like... Want a, want a note to end on. Good. Okay, so it would be great to get people's thoughts. Would you have been a customer uh, for a sports cat V8 um, before? No, no. Not me. <laughs> no. And, and what about the prospect of a US uh, Colorado coming here, right-hand drive with a V8? Would that be something um, you'd be interested in? So it'd be great to hear what people have to say. Now, we'll move to uh, cars that you can indeed buy, drive, um, all of the above in 2021. And Tom, could I start with you, please? It's a commercial vehicle of the relatively compact variety. Fill us in, please. Yeah, it's the uh, the new Volkswagen Caddy. And um, it's actually been for sale uh, in Australia for quite a while. We're only just getting to drive it now. But um, it's really quite good. Great. Um, okay, it's... thanks, Tom. Now, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, done. Let's move on. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by your enthusiasm there, mate. <laughs> Uh, well, no, I think the important thing is it's it's um, the first time that they've merged Caddy onto MQB. Um, okay. And it brings with it the technology platform inside the cabin um, shared with the uh, Mark 8 Golf. So that brings with it that kind of uh, physical and electronic architecture brings multimedia benefits, safety benefits, uh, makes it easier to upspec a car like the Caddy, yeah? Yeah, and the platform feels firmer and the steering is better. And even the, the biggest change is that they've moved from leaf, leaf springs at the back to spring springs at the back. Spring um, springs. Did spring he just springs. say spring, spring, spring springs? I've, I've heard that in engineering meetings. Yeah. Spring springs. Um, we don't want leaves, coils. We want spring, spring springs. Spring springs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's also, interestingly, it's got the new Evo series engines, which you'll note the Golf doesn't yet. So, um, right. Yeah. It's is a, that a... Petrol engine or diesel engine? Yeah, it's a 1.5 litre petrol. Petrol. Um, okay. I think, I think. don't quote me on this, but I think the petrols aren't here yet. We've only driven the diesels and the diesels arrived first. I don't right. think the petrols are actually here, but they they, they will be um, imminently. Um, and so, yeah, haven't driven the petrol. Can't tell you what the Evo petrol engine is like, which is the one that they were sort of, um, they had to jump through a few hoops to actually get that engine here in the first place. But yeah. Um, but uh, the other thing about it is they've got the same kind of dash cladding as the Golf 8, but it's got its own theme. Like there's these kind of, everything's made of like this deliberately really rugged plastic and the like motif running across the top of the dash looks like a polystyrene. Like it's a hard, hard wearing plastic, but it's right. like a polystyrene pattern just to give the, the car's cabin its own little personality and its Fantastic. own little design garnish like it, it's yes. cool it's really cool i like it um I, are you familiar with the peugeot partner 
because I always thought that car, that particular little van, which I, I drove fairly recently, probably moved the game on in terms of having a car-like uh, uh, um, work van that um, with the safeties, the necessary safeties and the refinement and the handling prowess and, you know, and the technologies as well, like the multimedia technologies that really moved the game on. Um, it would be interesting to see what that, well, that, how those two would be mm. given I Volkswagen's. I smell a comparison. I do comparison too. Test. Well, we were yeah. talking about, you know, what HSV is capable of. I always wanted to do a combo Sandman, you know, the Holden combo, which was their little uh, light commercial, but do a Sandman version and drop the GSI engine into the, uh, under the bonnet. Memo to Justin Hilliard. Uh, memo to Justin Hilliard. Please go to HSV and see if there is a combo HSV <laughs> Sandman. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. So um, civilized for uh, commercial use. Uh, obviously, I mean that's its that's its purpose in life. Um, great. Well, the fun the funny thing as well is um, you know we had that uh, article from Matt Campbell saying, hey, look, tradies tradies are people too. Uh, we you know they deserve uh, safety, and the, the caddy does have a a decent degree of minimum safety features in it. So cool. you, know, you get things like AEB standard, which is nice. Which is um, nice. And it's a few more other things, you know, option packed away, but it's it's nice that you definitely get the bare minimum creature comforts that for a long time, I think, you know, people get hopping into a, a more entry level commercial vehicle miss out on. And why, yeah, you know, it's like those parts are in the family, you know? Yeah. 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 And Thomas, what, what is the uh, starting price for this car, please? Uh, I was gonna. I gotcha. And while you're looking yeah, it up, gotcha. I just want to. While you're looking that, I just want to say that that car, the Caddy, is uh, very, very much in the French mold of little bread van type um, delivery things, bit. which actually kind of has its genesis in the car behind you, the two CV. Just saying. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yeah. Well, it's the van, a... the van version of the two CV had that wonderful corrugated uh, bodywork. Um, that looked straight out of God knows where, an apocalypse or World War II or whatever. I don't want to, it, it did, and it was so cool. It was all, I don't want to murder the name of the Pelham Van version because it had a funny oh, it name. Oh, it had its own uh, identity. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, I'm looking it up now, but I'm sure. So it has yeah. moved up in price quite a bit. Yeah. Um, that okay. is the one of the big things about uh, the Caddy. So the, the entry-level like lower-torque diesel, six-speed manual, short wheelbase version is 3499 Okay, Ooh. but I mean to to Matt Campbell's point, yes, uh, drivers of commercial vehicles deserve the creature comfort, but they also deserve the safety. Just because you're driving a commercial vehicle doesn't mean that your life is any less uh, worthwhile than anyone else's. So you you're probably willing to pay a little bit more to have that that safety on board. Here, 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 here. I agree. I think one of the other cool things about it is it, the range. Uh, for the caddy is like really expansive like you've got long long wheelbase versions whatever but it also works its way all the way up to the 54,990 uh, caddy caddy california which is the wow. um, oh, okay. self-contained camper so yeah cool um that one doesn't arrive till january or right. something like that i think make q1 22 that sort of thing um so uh they'll do a separate thing for that and we'll get to drive it then so exciting. Okay. Right. i guess if you bought the 2cv for Gonette. Is that it? Yeah, four got it. Uh, it in the nowadays, it, that's probably going to cost more than um, the uh, the Exius caddy anyway. So fantastic, fantastic. And just and just for the record, the one that I drove um, was the uh, long wheelbase, high torque diesel with the seven speed dual clutch auto. So that was right. a good thing. Great. All right. And if people, in all seriousness, if people do want the detail, they can read your story they, um, they, on the site. They so will be able to seriously. Definitely. They can yes. seriously read the story <laughs> and read about Spring Springs. Uh, spring springs. The spring springs, they're fantastic. Now, yes. Byron, thanks, Tom. Byron, yes. we'll move on to, to yourself. Uh -huh. Two things to talk about. Yep. First up, the car that you've been driving. Second, some news that you've got for everybody. So please, what have you been steering? I think there's a follow-on, like a companion piece uh, to the car Richard was driving um, and he mentioned in last week's podcast. Mm. Yep. I uh, had a good long steer for, uh, for a week in the new Kia Sorento plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, the FEV. Yeah. Um, this ain't cheap, speaking of uh, expensive things, but gee, you get a lot of car for the money. Okay. Um, more importantly, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, gentlemen, that um, it is Australia's first seven-seater plug-in hybrid. 
I think uh, it is. Is there a uh, seven seat Outlander? I no, I think I think you have to choose either plug in hybrid or seven seat for the Outlander. So okay. um, my right. inclination is maybe yes. Oh, we'll stuff it. No, Just, let's make oh, that claim. Well, no, 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 I think it, yeah. No, I think the, uh, and there's only five seater in its current guy, um, mm. in the old guys, in the new mm. guys, that'll change okay. um, because there were, there was packaging issues, I believe, pertaining okay. to, yep. But anyway, it's here. Yep. It's a plug in. Yep. And, you know, it's the top of the line Sereno. So it has the pleated seats, uh, the, uh, the definitely like the, the lovelier finishes, the electronic dashboard and all the controls. The great looking wheels. When I went up to it, I thought, Jesus, this is expensive for a Kia 81K. And then after a week, I thought, gee, I can live with this thing. Really? Yep. Just economical, smooth. It has, it doesn't have the, you know, in my currently, the best Sereno you, you can get is the diesel uh, with the all wheel drive in a mid spec uh, uh, grade. This thing is just, it combines a lot of what's good about that in a, an electrified version that, you know, you get pretty good real world, pure only EV. Yeah, yeah, I was going to well. say, what, what have you yeah. found? How, what uh, what you were know, you getting into? Realistically, 30, 35, just driving yeah. it normally, you know, which is yeah. decent. You know, you can potentially, you know, never fill that car up, never visit a petrol station if you're, if yeah. you're going um, from plug to plug. Um, it Look, the takeaway for this particular car for me is that it, absolutely feels like it's value for money okay but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant juggling act i imagine for you know a brand like here because it's come from you know a, a, a kind of challenger brand um decades ago now mm -hmm. but there are still some lingering kind of prejudices against uh kia and hyundai and as you step up in the price points you've really got to substantiate your product um, yeah you've got to be extra good uh, relative to the competition to, to Absol absolutely you can, um, read my launch review on this particular model as well um, ah. but the cool thing i found about it in particular that it does so well that so few plug-in hybrids don't get right is that the control over the drive like the electrification of the drive modes is excellent there are a lot of plug-in hybrids where they're really great as an EV. And then the moment you have to use the engine, they're sort of subpar and compromised in every way. Okay. And yep. there are some plug-in hybrids that are really great at um, letting you turn all of the electrification features off and drive it like a, pet, like a petrol car if you want. I found that the uh, E-Class e uh, plug-in hybrid was quite good at that. But what the key is great at is it has really clearly defined modes. There's, But importantly, there's a really good hybrid mode. And okay. so a lot of plug-in hybrids will have it so their default, you know, eco mode will just drain the battery first and then go onto the engine. Whereas yep. the Kia has got a brilliant hybrid mode where it will run up, you know, a little bit on the electric motor and then it will use the engine when you really push it. But it's really good at balancing the two. And if you if you give it a full charge, you can get like a whole week out of it and your fuel consumption will be like really, really low, like in the in mega, mega single digits. And it, yeah, it will it, run in parallel, Tom? So yes. you will have, yes, yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. You, you get, you get the best of both worlds in that situation, don't you? And, uh, and that's well said, Thomas, because that's correct. That is what I found. I found that in the end, I kind of sometimes thought I was just driving an EV when I needed it to be. And then I had a pretty punchy uh, seven seater large SUV Brilliant. when that, when that was yeah. required. So, right. um, and I, I think, the uh, the takeout from this particular experience is that the EV6, the coming EV6, which will be um, all electric, um, very much uh, is up there with the best in the world in terms of electrification and quality. Yeah. I mean, Kia is just not, you know, is, is no longer a drive away brand. Not that it ever really was, but no. it's definitely... It's oh, totally. definitely arrived. Yeah. But you know what I mean? There's sometimes, you know, the number of people just gradually diminish, but there's sometimes a residual kind of uh, reluctance. Mm. And yeah. I think uh, Hyundai Group is so great at the electrification stuff in terms of efficiency. They're doing efficiency better than anyone else. The Ionic, uh, the Ionic hatch, like, you know, the pride of the Ionic by it, and the uh, Kona EV are the two cars that I have scored the lowest consumption figures in out of any electric car i've ever driven i thought you were going to say i've scored the lowest, lowest yeah. out of 10 in any <laughs> review I've done. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe our matthew pritchard should edit that to just to say that just, just the to, low i've scored yeah. the lowest yeah. now in the interest of uh, time byron we'll move on to part two 
um, which is you now mark it down. It's the 19th of November, 2021, mm -hmm. uh, because you have an historical update. And there will be we, we, we're recording this on that day, Friday. That's right. And yep. I'm hang on. Us, yep. Yep. Tell uh, us sorry. What's I've got. Yep. I've got, I'm just getting news in right now. Yes. Um, news flash. Uh, tell us what's news, happened. Breaking news. I regret to inform everyone that uh, after 12 decades of representation, not always, but sporadic, but definitely every single decade since the 1920s, uh -huh, uh -huh. Chrysler will no longer be available new in Australia. Right. Um, yep. Australia, which was the last bastion of uh, the Pentastar brand with the 300. In, in right-hand drive. In right-hand drive. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, uh, qualifying that. Because otherwise um, it's an even bigger story. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just a global story, but this yeah, one's yeah. a regional story. Um, the, the, with the cessation of the 300 series in this country, the, the brand is going as well. And that yeah. is heartbreaking because for many Australians, or for many people generally, because a lot of the Cries Australian products was uh, were sold internationally in South yes. Africa, uh, obviously New Zealand, and imported even to the UK. It is an end of an era. Yep. 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 Um, we used to make Chrysler's, uh, the Chrysler Valiant, and uh, before that, the Royal, which was based on a Plymouth design from the 50s. Both those cars had extensive Australian design inputs as they progressed. Uh, yep. to the point where they became all Australian, or particularly yes. the uh, the Valiant. Of course, we had the Chrysler Charger, cool. uh, which is a high -charger. charger, yep. which is a legendary Australian muscle car, yep. very much uh, one for the pantheon of the greatest, one of the greatest um, sports, Australian locally made sports cars of all time. Yep. Definitely all I can see is Gagan across the... Uh, the blackout across the top of the windscreen. Yeah, you need to change yep. your medication if that's all you can see, <laughs> uh, James Cleary. Yes. Um, and, and of course, also the little things like, um, you know, Chrysler was just, it was regarded as part of the big three. Um, it certainly challenged uh, the Falcon as it tried to catch uh, the Holden, uh, the all conquering Holden if, um, in the 60s and then in the 70s. Um, there's an article that uh, will be up by the time you read this at carsguide.com.au. Uh, my article, please check it out. Um, yep. Yep. And it is really sad. We all have probably a Chrysler connection. Do you yep. have one, James? I've got a good story. My father used to work for the Commonwealth Government in the public service and uh, occasionally he'd have to go on a, a trip somewhere or other and there was a pool, like pool cars were kept um, near uh, probably Ultimo in Sydney. And I'd go with him and we'd pick up the car and it was invariably an immense Valiant wagon. Um, and I would sit in the car. It was like sitting in a moving football stadium. You know, it was so enormous. And I just thought it was great. And the, the one we had had those repeating indicators on the front of the, uh, the front guard so that when uh, you turn the indicator on, you could spot. And I thought that was unbelievably cool. That was a VF, I think, or VG. You, you know, I don't. I was just yeah. this little guy looking and wondering at, at this massive boat that I was in. Yeah. Um, there's actually a connection with uh, our first story that we talked about that is the uh, HSV Colorado. Um, uh, okay, how yeah. so? Uh, with the, the Chrysler, because uh, Chrysler um, uh, reintroduced the Pacer oh, right. name on the 300 uh, in 2019 that, and 2020. So they that's right. Yep, so they that's did. right. Yes. Um, and that you know, it was probably an attempt to you know, kind of, uh, you know, fluff up yeah. the sales and keep interest in the, was, in the series man, going. A, a Hemi Pacer was the thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that was an Australian um, uh, initiative based on American ideas, obviously, mm. um, in, in, the, uh, 19, in, in, the, in the 70s. And it was quite a success. Uh, mm. I think uh, Falcon XR6 yep. uh, kind of yep. um, modifications. Same vibe. Or, same yep, vibe. Same vibe. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So Vail Chrysler Australia. It doesn't yep. mean that um, Jeep's still around, of course, and obviously Stellantis, the group, is um, has got huge plans. Um, yep. In this press release, they said that uh, the, the they're introducing more and innovative uh, Jeep models to take their place, including the uh, the new Grand Cherokee L seven seater or eight seater, whatever it is, or six seater. I'm not sure. They're being a bit vague on that, as well as of course the four XC electrified plug-in hybrid electric version of the Grand Cherokee, okay. which um, I said grand then, as if I went all posh. I meant to say grand, Grand okay. Cherokee. Okay. All yeah, right. Well, so. that, that's, yeah, big news. Thank you. Thank you for that update, uh, Byron. Yeah, big sad yeah. news for some. And I'll finish off. This week, I had uh, the opportunity 
to drive the Hyundai i20N, which is a car that's been much talked about, much anticipated. Um, it's a competitor, direct competitor. It's almost the same price as a Fiesta ST from Ford or a Volkswagen Polo um, GTI. And that is about $32,500. There's only a, a few hundred dollars either side for the Ford and the Volkswagen. So all of a sudden we've got this little trio of, of hot hatches now. Um, it's a 1.6 litre turbo four and a six speed manual only um, and, and front wheel drive. 150 kilowatts and 275 newton meters, but it's just this brilliant combination of a really flat torque plateau. Uh, and as it starts to dip another flat plateau of power when it takes over higher in the rev range, you just always got something happening, really great little engine. And it has continually variable valve duration. So um, not, not timing, um, not opening, it's the duration of the opening. And it gives you this really great balance between performance and economy right across uh, the rev range. And it even has an overboost function. So if you're pinning it um, between 2000 and 4000 RPM, you get extra torque, so 304 Newton meters. But it, it's not like a blindingly fast car. We're talking a bit under seven, like 6.7 seconds, not to 100. But it, so it's quick. It's like a nippy, classic little hot hatch, um, about 1.2 tonnes. And it has this torsen type mechanical limited slip differential. And really to sum it up, I love it. I love this car. It is great. It is so much fun and not in a special occasion way. This is what I said in the review, which is up on the site. Um, it, every, no matter where you are or when you drive it, you can have fun in this car. It's just so engaging. Um, dynamically, it's brilliant. It's really balanced. The steering, the brakes, the seats, everything is about having fun behind the wheel. And I'd call it affordable. And good value because you get a lot of safety packed in there. It's surprisingly space efficient. It's the only version of the i20 that we're going to get in this current generation, according to Hyundai. Um, so if you're going to use it day to day, it's got pretty good volume um, in terms of storage. The back seat accommodated me um, sitting up straight and behind my driving position. Um, the only minuses I could come up with is that it is firm in the ride, but a hot hatch at this price point you're not going to get that, you know, blend of, of dynamics and a, and a cushy ride. It is firm, but that's kind of what you're signing on for. Um, there's a launch control function, which is unusual for a manual car. Um, found it a bit fiddly to actually get it to, to engage and do its thing, but it's there. Um, the turning circle, much and all as it's marked down as 10 and a half metres, it felt like it was carving this massive arc, like the QE2. So I don't know what's going on there. It, the steering is geared such that you get a nice rapid turn in. The downside of that is that you get a fairly big turning circle. Um, and it looks pretty angry. It's got these menacing, it looks like Cartman from um, South Park when he's angry. You know, it's got these um, angry headlights. That'll appeal to some and not others. It might be a little bit um, Marmite for people on, on the looks. But I, I, lo I like it for what it's worth and really enjoyed the drive. So what, what would you have that or the uh, Fiesta ST, James? It's, it's a close thing. You'd want to actually drive them back to back, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously haven't had the opportunity to do that. But this car, that, that limited slip diff, I was doing my best out of really tight corners. You're going uphill and you're putting the power down as early as you can and you're expecting even a chirp out of the inside front tyre. Nothing, silence. It just went. Um, so it's really good uh, mechanically and in every other way. I find, it, I find it pretty hard to fall. I really loved it. And, and I think it's priced competitively because it's right there with its two most obvious competitors. Gee, I've, you, are so, you were so animated that last few minutes <laughs> talking about that car. You clearly loved it. Was it. it was great fun. Yeah, it was great, great. fun. God, that, we, now, we, we need more cars like this, don't we? We do. And so there's a written review on the site and I did a video. And um, if you, if you want to have a click on either of those, please feel free. But uh, it was just, it's just really good. Welcome, a welcome addition um, to the, to the new car market, as far as I'm concerned. Now, last week we were talking about um, potential additions and some cars that are in the, in the current market around performance wagons, small hot wagons. And we got some good feedback. Um, Bill Catapotas said, look, great show as always, gents. Thank you, Bill. Um, he fell in love with an R36, meaning R36 Passat in 2008. Uh, he couldn't get enough of driving it, but the DSG broke and the extended warranty company was charged over $8,000 to fix it, as well as 4K for an aircon compressor. And for him, VW lost some of, it, some of its shine um, through that episode. 
Uh, but it, he does say that he doesn't imagine any high performance Audis, BMWs, Mercs would be any cheaper um, to fix. But just for a laugh, he said, I'll admit publicly that in 2016, I bought an EA SPAC five speed manual wagon. So, of course, that's a Falcon to teach the kids to drive manual and haul the Kelpie to the dog beach. And I enjoy that almost as much as the R36 for a whole lot of different in, uh, reasons. The holes in the exhaust system provide a satisfying engine note. And um, I still have it today. The R36 is long gone. Oh, so what I'm, a, I'm, what, what a brother. great I, car. I have, a, I have an EA Falcon as well. Good on you. That is... An S-Pac five-speed manual wagon. That's got to be a super rare car now. With leaf leaf suspension. Oh, no. Can I correct you there? Hotchkiss rear suspension. Thank you, Byron. Oh, hot, that's, oh, hotchkiss, was, hotchkiss. that's how it's always described. Yeah. Ford so never not, called it a leaf spring. Hotchkiss rear suspension. That's, yeah, that's right. So no, no coils, coils here. Or spring springs. That's right. but spring springs. No, they yeah, were spring springs. hotchkiss. So that was interesting from Bill. And great that he got such enjoyment out of an entirely different wagon oh. um, in such a different way. Now, Lofty Visions, uh, Lofty said, great podcast again, guys. I'm a big fan of wagons, especially old bangers that become family wheelbarrow cars. So, you know, a bit like Bill. Um, maybe there's a good podcast idea in Bangonomics. Um, and I think that's a really interesting idea. There's, there was a pervasive kind of um, thing in the US called clunker cars, which was typically um, taken up by college students buy a car with as much registration on it as you can and just drive it until the registration runs out and take it to be crushed. It's like, I'm not going to spend any money on this. If it continues to run, great. If it doesn't, I'll buy another clunker. So, you know, I like the term bangonomics. Um, as for fast wagons, I would have loved to see a manual Kia Stinger wagon. Um, shame they never made one. And that's an interesting idea. I think the Stinger would lend itself to a really sleek looking wagon. But there's a G70 wagon coming. True. Well, shooting break. Shooting break. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which is same platform. Same which was one of, our, one of our hot, car, hot wagons from last week. So I suppose it's not a, not a huge stretch to think about a Kia Stinger wagon. Um, I've seen one in time. Australia. It looks really good. The Genesis? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I agree. I, was... I, hear, I hear there's one at HSVs, isn't there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Now, Is that what you now saw? we also had a bit of a dig uh, at CBTs and Anthony Abdo, and I just wonder if he's related to the uh, National Rugby League CEO, uh, Andrew Abdo, um, he says he loves a CBT, hates the jerkiness of a dual clutch or the five, six, eight uh, sequential with its hop in gear changes. He's obviously experienced something like that. Uh, hitting a hill and RPMs climbing slowly with momentum is better than hunting for gears. It's the future. Um, I would add here, my first understanding of uh, uh, a CVT was the DAF Variomatic, which I think went back to at least the 60s, if not the late 50s. And maybe it existed before that, I'm not sure. And, and Williams tested a Formula One car with a CVT uh, 20 years ago. So it, it's, it's been around uh, for some time, but I'm just splitting hairs. But he says, Anthony says, if you save half a litre per 100 kilometres, that's hundreds of dollars a year. Where do you guys sit on the CVT? I think Anthony's correct in that um, the CVT is uh, a foretaste of what an electric vehicle feels like for many people, a single yeah. gear, reduction gear um, experience, you know, and providing those benefits, as he said. If you uh, drive a, Sel a Kia Seltos or um, a, a new Subaru with a CVT or, you know, what, even one of the um, the uh, Corolla uh, TNGA Toyotas. Yep. Mm. You would never. You, you'd wonder what the fuss against those, the CVTs. Those, is I about. agree. The, I, the Corolla think, with CVT is pretty good. Mm. I think the key with the CVT is it has to be consumer friendly. It's it's the same with the DSG really. Like the like the. But I think a CVT is more suited to your average everyday Corollas. You know, passenger cars like that. They ha it has to be good, though. It can't be grating, you know, otherwise you just end up with the same problem as well, a, a dual clutch. You may as well have a torque converter. Because at, the, the, at, the risk, at the risk of being a broken record, the thing I said last week is the thing that I think a lot of people find disconcerting is the disconnect between your road speed and the engine mm, speed. So mm. a CVT is going to have the engine going all over the place in the rev range whilst your road speed is linear and consistent. The engine isn't. And that's sort of off-putting. And that's mm. why it feels droney and, and uh, odd uh, at times. 
but I think uh, the way well, my mother drives, it, that, really, that she would never like, you know, yep. floor it in such a way that you feel strainy. For most people, it just feels Good normal point. and smooth. Fair point. Yeah, yeah. fair point. I, Sorry, still, I, I just think like where we're at now with um uh, like the ace and eight speed torque converter that's such a good transmission and it doesn't take any of the fun out of driving and i know we're a bit disconnected because we're enthusiasts and we want a little bit of that fun when driving so i think you know if you've got a good cvt like the, the ones in the toyotas are, are, pre, are pretty good as, as as we say and especially when they combine with those hybrid systems they're, they're, they're pretty brilliant yep. yep um but i think the key of it is if it's not you know, consumer friendly, if you've got this poor little engine just trying its hardest and this really rubbery, nasty feeling, that's that's not great. Like, I think there is still a class of buyer that, that's not yep. going to like that. Let's let's just say it's not black or white. There are benefits and there are some uh, things to consider um, with that means of transferring uh, power and torque. Um, now, then, just a couple more. Uh, Hammer Rocks, our old mate Hammer, Another excellent topic, he says, in response to Stephen Otley's rhetorical question. Now, we were talking about Alfa Romeo, um, and Steve said, is there a more mismanaged car brand? And Hammer actually said, yes, Honda Australia, which is, which is a pretty sharp shot at the fact that Honda has changed its uh, business structure in, in the way it, it actually sells cars and seems to be uh, suffering somewhat in terms of volume. Um, Byron, do you have any thoughts on, on the way Honda is, is doing business these days? I think it's a big picture situation. Um, I think Honda quite sensibly realised that it cannot compete against um, Toyota and uh, uh, Kia, Hyundai and, and MG yep. on price and yep. never will. And it, would, it was a push-pull for Honda because when they did try and uh, by decontenting the cars or just making the cars more mainstream. And going people for volume. Complained. Yeah. yeah. When they went up volume, people complained saying, oh, whatever happened to the BMW of Japan? Whatever happened to the exquisitely engineered uh, multi-wishbone uh, equipped, suspended yep. equipped Hondas like a Prelude and uh, a Civic VTIRs and all that sort of stuff? Yep. You can't have them both. And I think Honda has decided it's going to go back to being a bit of a niche player, a premium niche yep. player it definitely yep. has the runs on the board in terms of being able to do that um so i for one think let's just see what happens Fair um, call. yeah as long as i just bring interesting cars to australia like don't drop the jazz you know i hate the fact that we're not gonna get the new generation jazz bring in the um the electric vehicles um to to justify um someone like me who's giving them a, a chance i think that's the problem isn't it like like for so long Cars like Jazz VTI was such a good seller for them. Mm. And now we're in a place where, okay, they want to be more premium. They want to be a bit more niche, but they don't, I don't think they have the product right now to justify that position. Like we do need Honda E, we do need new yeah. jazz, you know? Yes, but it's yeah, coming. But look, we're, it's, it's, it's the darkest uh, hour before the dawn here because we, we're about to get the new Civic. We're about to get the new HRV with the, with the E power, whatever it's called. Um, that, no, sorry, the hybrid. The hybrid, the EH, uh, whatever it's, it's going to happen. And I think that um, I just wish Honda would just go All right. Let's uh, bring in a Jazz. Let's charge thirty grand for it or twenty five grand for it. Have the electrified version. I think it'll sell mm. because it looks great. It's well packaged. It has more space than the usual B segment car. Yep. I I think that it's. I, I simply think it's they're being realistic. And I love your optimism and I hope you're right. It's an interesting point. <laughs> interesting. Well said. Well said, Byron. Um, Hammer, feel free to come back at us on that one. <laughs> now, Damo, he says the Octavia RS wagon needs the optional packages pushing the price up, not the bargain it used to be and not very different from GTI in price. GTI has also had a large price increase, so no longer the reference point for affordable performance. I'm waiting on Cupra pricing, perhaps there will be better value. Um, and we're all kind of waiting for, for Cupra. That's um, a really good point, that it could be just an extra Volkswagen group uh, thing in the mix there to, to offer even more options. All right, now, and then lastly, Sukhoi Romantic said, nice one, guys. Love listening to the podcast while playing racing games, luxury gaming. So that we are a part of Sukhoi Romantic's luxury gaming lifestyle which feels great, I've got to say. Um, all right, now with that, we have reached the finish line uh, for this episode. So it's time to say thank you, Byron. Thank and you, James. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. 
And thanks to our Viceroy of Production, face feeler and professional sleeper, Mr. Pritchard, for unrelentingly pushing out the edges of the podcast envelope. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt reading, I have no idea what I'm doing. Tartan plus fours and leopard skin clogs. Incredible, as always. Jump into the conversation. Cars Guide is on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple Podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. We love a five-star review. Uh, thank you. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, I was talking to a mate of mine this week about the pros and cons of motorcycles. And uh, he agreed you're pretty exposed in traffic. But said the flip side is they're great for quickly getting to the front of queues. Only snag is the other people in the post office are always terrified. <laughs> <laughs>